Okay, love you, thanks. Okay, should we get going? Um, well, we've had a quick change around, and I've morphed into the chair for the last session, and um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Stephanie Taylor, who's now going to talk to us about discourse analysis. Uh, and Stephanie has written and one, published widely, and included books on discourse analysis and ethnography. And her latest uh, book is Narrative Identity of Place. And for those of you who are interested, there are these flyers uh, just on the side there, so I encourage you to go after this stage. Um, so can you talk about discourse analysis? So Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for coming back after coffee. It must have been tempting to stay outside in the sun. Um, well, what is discourse analysis? And unfortunately, the answer to that isn't straightforward. There are a lot of different possible uses of the term discourse and discourse analysis, both terms. So I'm going to look at two working definitions. The first is of discourse analysis as the study of well-established meanings or ideas around a topic which shape how we can think and talk about it. And so following this, researchers refer to sets or systems of these meanings as discourses. So you'll find people talking about discourses of education, discourses of health and illness, and so on. And as an example of this, I want to look at the discourse of countries, or better, nations, or nation states. So a discourse analysis of nations and nation states could focus on names and definitions. So we could think about England. England, Britain, the UK, the British Isles, part of Europe. Each of those entities can be called a nation or a nation state, and each of them has a different definition. And each definition, of course, includes and excludes certain people, different people. So if we define where we are now as England, as opposed to Britain or the UK or part of Europe, then that's got implications for who belongs here. So some people here will be British but not English, or European but not British. They're differently positioned in relation to England. And we could work up those distinctions and definitions in language. We could go to dictionaries and history books and geography books and official documents and so on. But they're not just words. They have consequences for how people feel, for where they're allowed to be. And we might investigate how the different words are linked to laws, to rights, to institutions, what it means to have official nationality or citizenship maybe how that's different to what it was 20 or 50 years ago, who's eligible, what they're entitled to. And this example of discourses of the nation shows the relationship between language and power. It shows how meanings go beyond language into how people live and what they do and what they can do. And the often cited phrase for this is that discourse is material. But this is quite a static. Uh, it seems to suggest that meanings don't change, and of course they do. So discourse researchers are often more concerned with what we might call the moving picture. How meanings change in different situations and over time. And how they are changed by being challenged or contested. So that prompts a second working definition of discourse analysis. The second one, the study of how meanings are established, used, challenged, and changed, including in talk, though as I'll show, not exclusively in talk. Now the change might be historical. What Michel Foucault called a genealogical study might investigate the history or the development of discourses of nation. So the researcher might want to look at how people started to think about the world in certain terms, as Britain, as England, and so on. And a quite different kind of research would be to look at 
ordinary life and what people do with certain meanings, meanings around nations. In other words, what they do, so discourse practices. And this has been the concern of social psychologists. Okay, so one set of practices around the nation, which has been very evident recently with the World Cup, involves displaying the flag. The social psychologist Michael Billig called this flagging the nation. Displaying the flag can just be about more of the same. It's reminding people that they or we are English or British or whatever. Um, Michael Billig was very interested in how in the United States the nation is flagged very regularly, for example, in children's classrooms in the morning and so on. This flagging reinforces the discourses of nation. But it can also be about redefining what the nation is, challenging or contesting established discourses. So, moving away from football for the moment, the three national flags here, each in a way refers to the one that isn't there, which of course is the black, white, and uh, sorry, the red, white, and blue Union Jack. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but the black Union Jack. Obviously, St. George for England. And then the green one, which is a relatively recent one um, associated with ecological awareness. And so each of these is saying something about who's included or excluded or what kind of nation the person who's flagging wants to be associated with. What it's saying about who we or they are or should be. So discourses of the nation are being reinforced or contested here. Now although I've looked at flags here, the majority of discourse researchers are interested specifically in meaning and language and what people do with those. And newspapers are a rich source and often where people get their material. So on the theme of discourses of nation and going back to football, look at from the Observer recently, John Terry, football wise, we can mix it with anyone. But first and foremost, we're a very proud country and we've got to go out there wanting to win. Now a discourse researcher might be interested, for example, in some of the small details of this, the use of the word we. We seems to be everyone in the nation and everyone in the England football team. Now, of course, there might be people here even who would say that they don't want to be in the same nation as the England football team. Mm -hmm. um, but this talk doesn't really allow for that possibility. But the point of interest for the discourse analyst is that this we isn't straightforwardly descriptive. It's more like an encouragement. It's saying it's an encouragement to become part of the collective we. And it's also an encouragement to make or reinforce a certain connection between England the nation and England the football team. So the language is doing something. It's functional. And another point, we are proud which is an interesting claim. I mean, is it good to be proud? I mean, perhaps yes, if you've got something to be proud of, but it could be a rather unpleasant cr claim. It sounds rather arrogant. The function here seems to be to assert that we've got something to be proud about. So it's a claim of quality, and it's a claim of difference from other nations, even superiority. So for the discourse analyst, this language isn't a straightforward description, and the question isn't whether it's true or not. The point is that it has a function or a purpose. And as I say, I'd suggest that it was intended to encourage both the England team and the supporters, and to encourage more people to support the team. But then there are some other things going on here. John Terry's language is encouraging, but the reporter who wrote it up in the paper, and it was in one of those little quote of the week sections of the paper, 
That reporter was perhaps doing something a little bit different, criticising or mocking John Terry. Meanings change with the situation or context, and that's another point of interest for the discourse analyst. Now, I'm not suggesting that these kind of uses of language are fully intended or planned in advance like a conspiracy, though occasionally they may be. The point for the discourse analyst is that language is always functional. It's always doing something, just in the same way that bodies are always doing something. They're always breathing or sitting, whatever, sleeping. Now, discourses of around nation um, can have other functions, of course. They can be used to do other, more serious things, even if the starting point is still football. Um, I'm going to look at an example from, an, uh, from some research by these people, again, social psychologists, and it's from, taken from this article. It's an extract from an interview which was done as a part of a study where people who supported football teams were interviewed. And as I say, you can find a full discussion of the research in the article, but I'm just going to take one extract. This is from an So Charlie is the interviewee, and Jackie was the researcher and interviewer. Charlie, I'm English. It's in the blood. You can't help. It's in the blood. And that gives you certain characteristics that make you... It does. It makes you shave your head, put a bit of weight on, and watch football. <laughs> okay, so quite fun so far. But just see how it continues. <coughs> and this is a continuation from the same point. Do you think you can choose to be English? I think they had more of a sense of Englishness, say, earlier on, in the, well, from the day dot all the way up to, say, the 1970s. They had more of a sense of being English than they have now because it's such a multiracial society that people who are being brought into it don't have as much value of where they come from than what they used to have. And the way we see it, well, I see it, a few of the lads in there on St George's Day, we're just trying to keep alive, you know, the theme, if you like, of where we are. Okay, you might be beginning to get a feeling of where this is going. So, and this is again a straight continuation. So if you're of a different race, then you're not English. The one means a one second pause. You mean like if you've got Pakistani parents, but you were born here, are you English? No, you're Pakistani. Why aren't you English? Because your parents are Pakistanis. So if your parents had been Welsh and you'd have been born here, I'd have been Welsh. You'd be Welsh, yeah. So it's not on where you were born, but on where your parents were born. No, it's blood. It's blood, isn't it? So talk which was initially quite jokey has turned unpleasantly racist in tone. And of course my point isn't that football talk is always racist talk, because it's not, obviously. But it's that certain well-established ideas, these discourses of the nation, and relatedly national identity, being British or English or whatever, can be used for racist purposes to exclude people. Discourse analysis is about looking at what's being done in language and talk, and also about the ideas which drive the talk, even if they're not spelled out in detail. And the researchers did set out to spell out some of these ideas. So they said about this particular extract, that there were two assumptions operating talk. One assumption was support for the England team follows naturally from a sense of pride in a distinctive English national identity. And the second, the assumption English national identity is naturally and inevitably a function of personal and collective ancestry. Now, these are assumptions. The point and the question for the analyst is not whether they're true or untrue. It's that these ideas, it's the ways that these ideas are tied up with nation and national identity and football. They're part of the discourses of nation and they can be used in certain ways, including unpleasant ways. But let's look at another different use. This connection between identity and ancestry, what the speaker in the interview called blood. 
Discourses of nation, well, it's part of that, but it's also dis part of discourses of family and home, not coincidentally. Discourses are multiple and overlapping. It's not that they're in neat boxes with boundaries around them. It's that the analyst identifies them as sets of meanings, but another analyst might identify a slightly different set. And discourses can be taken up in different ways. So, in other words, the same ideas can be used differently. This idea of ancestry or blood, this idea that who you are depends on family and family history, that becomes part of how we make sense of where we belong. And this operates even at the level of a flat or a house. So here's a woman talking about the town where she lives. This is an interview from some research I conducted just about around about two. Where do you feel most at home then? I think feeling at home is a hard job for me, but I think I think about it a lot because I think town name, and that's the town where she lives now, I've anonymized it, I think town name is the place. Because I've been here so long, I've been here longer than anyone else, and have so much in my own history now attached to town name. But it's hard to say that it's home, because you know, or, or that I belong, because my early history wasn't in town name, as not many people's was. But as I say, there are no, there's no family, no extended family. There are only relatively recent friends, you know, anyone over the last 20 years. So what we see here is this problem around home. She's been there 20 years, which is quite a while, but because of this blood issue, she's feeling that it's not properly her home. There's an idea in this talk that home depends on being bo born and bred in a place, as I put it, having an early history there and family. And yet, of course, so many people move, not just at the level of migrating, but just moving house, like this woman, that belonging somewhere can be problematic for them. And that's a problem of our society, which I looked into as a discourse analyst, how people use available discourses to make connections between who I am and where I live, or sometimes how they can't do that, how they might make connections to another place in their lives, or even to an imagined place. And that kind of study of identity, of who we are and how we understand ourselves, that's another important use of discourse analysis, especially, again, in social psychology. OK, so to summarize, what is discourse analysis? Well, we've seen how it might involve the study of discourses as sets of meanings and the study of discourse practices, including what people do in their talk, which can include making sense of who they are, their identities, a form of self-making. Discourse analysts are to understand our social worlds and their complexity, to understand the implications of certain meanings and worldviews or beliefs, and to understand themselves, ourselves, because the discourse analyst is part of what she or he is studying, to understand ourselves within our social worlds. And we've seen that discourse research might involve the analysis of different kinds of data. You might have language data, perhaps from historical documents like speeches, acts of parliament, laws, regulations, perhaps from newspapers, or you might be analysing talk recorded, transcribed, and so on, like the examples we looked at. But the discourse analyst might also use more varied material, like the flags. I said discourse practices are about what people do. The analyst of um, discourses of nation might want to look at um, political activities, like people joining parties, campaigning, trying to get election, make new laws. Might look at representations. Uh, you know, pictures, we're back to the flags again. So you can see that a discourse analyst might use already existing data or might collect new data. Now, 
There have been criticisms of discourse net analysis, inevitably. One criticism is that it's deterministic. In other words, the focus isn't on people as free agents. It seems to start with meanings, with meaning systems and discourses. It's as if the ideas make society and people, instead of people making ideas as speakers or lawmakers or language users of some kind. Well, I've shown that people are active. They do things with meanings. Practices of talk and other behavior can reinforce or contest discourses. But yes, there is an assumption here that social life is a bit like a play that's already started, that we come into. We come on stage as actors, we're improvising, we're using whatever props and so on, but we find ourselves already in a scene. We are social beings who are socially made, and that is part of the essential um, assumptions of the approach. Another criticism is that it's all just language, which sounds a bit like public relations, saying things in a nice way. So, for example, don't talk about immigrants, talk about new Britons, which is people like me. The kind of detail that people sort of tend to dismiss now as PC. But the counter argument here is that discourse is material. Meanings go beyond language into how people live and what they do. There are also some practical points about uh, discourse analysis, which follow a bit from what we've heard this morning. Um, first, there's no simple recipe. I've given two working definitions, but you'll find many more precise definitions varying slightly from author to author. So there's no recipe. You need to think about the underlying theory. You need to decide what tradition you'll follow. And the discipline that you're working in will, will be influential here. There are different approaches in sociolinguistics, sociology, social psychology. But almost every discourse analytic study has to present and justify its own approach. So selecting from what's gone before, building up an argument for the approach. And that actually is true of most kinds of qualitative research. The analysis is a slow, detailed process, which is very time consuming. It's an iterative process. So you'd start with an interest. You'd look at the data. You'd return from analysis back to the project as a whole. You might redefine your focus, and so on. So quite a time consuming, not an easy approach. What why might you want to do it? Well, uh, because of the varied possibilities, including the different forms of data which might be used and might be combined, because it's interesting. Uh, it's about established meanings, how the world is understood, how we make sense of it, all the ideas which swirl about and come down through history. And to study discourse in this way is to attempt to understand our social worlds and the implications of certain meanings and world views. And beliefs. So it's about the complexity of our social worlds and ourselves within them. Now I haven't brought references, um, an oversight, I'm sorry, but also partly because as I say there are so many different approaches. My card is on the corner of the table and if anyone wants to take that there are some references on my website and I'd be also happy to answer questions if people want to contact me about anything or ask now. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We have time.